This has to be one of the most beautiful cities I've ever been in in my life. And uh, I've been to some beautiful cities. This, this place is amazing. And this place is amazing. I feel like Winston Churchill, I should like have a speech or something. And uh, you know, your country is like, you have buildings older than our country. Well, let me say it this way. Most of your buildings are older than our country. And uh, we were in teepees when you guys were, you know, building like monuments and stuff. And uh, it's just so beautiful. So um, thank you so much for that introduction and hope I can live up to some of it. <laughs> Sometimes people introduce you and you're like, oh, they have another speaker. <laughs> you know what I mean? I like being in England because you understand my humor. In America, I have to explain it all every time. <laughs> so, um, well, um, I'd like to, let's see, Rachel's with me and Bethany's with me. Would you stand? Is, are any more of our team here? We're going to have a really good time this weekend. Like, I usually have pretty high expectations, but like, I really like, I feel like God's doing something really powerful. And, and to be in this country at this time feels like a Kairos moment to me in history. And we were in London this week and just um, meeting with some folks. And it was just like, we just had, Rachel kept saying, I think this is the most powerful meeting we ever had. And then we'd have another one. It was like, I think this was the most powerful meeting we ever had. And and so um, I'm, I'm excited to be here. And um, my, my wife would have loved to have been here, but she likes horses better than people. So <laughs> she stayed back. We have two horses, and we don't have two horses. She has two horses, and I have a wife. <laughs> people are like, you like horses? I'm like, no, I like marriage. <laughs> and, uh, I, uh, if, uh, for those of you that don't know me, I, I've been married 42 years. I met Kathy when she was 12. We got engaged when she was 13. That is a true story. And uh, we got married when she was 17, and we have four kids. We had all our kids by the time she was 22. Our oldest is adopted, so that might explain some of it. And uh, so we have kids that are 40, all the way down to 36, and our three biological kids are all in the ministry. How many of you know you're in the ministry? If you receive Jesus Christ, you're in the ministry. Like, you may suck at it, but you're in it, right? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> People are like, I want to be in the ministry. Do you know Jesus? Yes, you're in the ministry. There's only a royal priesthood. There's no other people, right? And Jesus, that's the truth. Jesus said, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans means conquer of the lay people. They were the people that actually um, split the church into two groups of people, the, the ministers and the uh, lay people. And so how many know Jesus hates the deeds of Nicolaitans? And when people say, we have lay ministry, I'm like, there's no such thing as lay ministry. There's only priests. In the Old Testament, there was a Levitical priesthood that was one tribe. In the New Testament, there's a royal priesthood. If you receive Jesus, you became a priest. The only question is, where do you do your priestly, your priestly ministry? So well, that's what I believe, and I'm right about that because I thought about it. Um, <laughs> I externally process, so. About three years ago, I was preaching live in live streaming, place was packed, and I, I, you know, uh, the, all the preachers will know that, you know, they've had this experience, but I, I'm preaching on my notes, and I, you know, I have notes, and I'm preaching off my notes, and I have this message all planned, and I, I'm sharing, and then I get this idea, and I'm like, oh, I felt like the Holy Spirit, so for 15 minutes, I, like, chase this rabbit, and then, and then I chase it long enough to realize, like, oh, that's actually not biblical, <laughs> so then I said, Oh, you know that stuff I taught like the last 15 minutes? Like, that's actually not biblical. Then I, let's get back to the scripture. And, and the people were like, they thought I was joking, but I really wasn't. So, um, so Lord, thank you for what you're doing in these people. And we just pray that you would do something profound in each of us tonight. And Holy Spirit, we're aware that we just have words. But we understand that you make words worlds. And we pray, God, that you would expand our world. That the kingdom within us would become the kingdom around us. That literally that you would move through us to a, to a world that's desperate and dying and in need of light. Amen. Um, I want to talk to you about changing epic seasons. And so um, I, I'll say this. I believe that we're in the second greatest epic season transition in the history of the world. Now, let me tell you, when I use the word epic, 
I'm talking about the word E-P-O-C-H. And you guys probably spell it differently. You know, thank God for the Americans. Like, you guys have screwed up the English language. <laughs> so at least we're, God had us Americans, you know, actually preserve the English language. <laughs> I was in your country three years in a row on 4th of July. I mean, what do you say on 4th of July from the podium? Like, uh, would you guys like to celebrate 4th of July? Like, you're the guys we left. <laughs> anyway, okay, okay. But I want to define epic, E-P-O-C-H for you. Yes, I understand, yeah. And you guys say honor. We like to honor you. You're like, what? We like to honor you. Oh, no, please don't. <laughs> I already had that cut off once. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, anyway, sorry. E-P-O-C-H is? In the way means, biblically, a way in which, the way in which God deals with a certain people in a certain season. A way in which God deals with a certain people in a certain season. And I'd like to propose to you that we're in the greatest transition in the history of the world, the second greatest. The first greatest transition would be the cross. How many know that the cross divided history? Now, Jesus said it like this in Matthew 5, 43, you've heard it said, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your neighbor, pray for those who persecute you, and be like your Father in heaven who makes it rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Where did they hear, love your neighbor and hate your enemy? I'd propose to you, it was God. For 2,000 years, God said to, for instance, Joshua, go into the land and kill everybody. Don't let anybody live. You remember that Saul, the very first king of Israel, actually lost his kingship because he extended mercy to an enemy king. And the, the prophet Samuel came with his sword and cut the enemy Agog at, up with the sword. And then he was the, the prophet who cut him up, was the good guy in the movie, and Saul, who extended mercy, was the bad guy. How many know Deuteronomy 18 says, from verse 1 to verse 14, God says, this is all the blessings. If you serve me, here's all the blessings I will do for you. I'll bless you when you come in. I'll bless you when you go out. I'll bless your children, your flocks, your crops, and so on and so forth. But from verse 15 to verse 64 are all the curses. I think it's verse 30 of uh, uh, Deuteronomy 18 that says, and it will, if you serve other gods, it will not rain in your land. <laughs> now, think about it. When Elijah called for a famine, you'll notice that in uh, 1 Kings 18, you'll notice that God never told Elijah to call for a famine. It says Elijah called for the famine. Where did he get the idea? In the Bible. Because how many know Ahab and, and Jezebel were ruling, and God said, and they were serving other gods. And God said, if you serve other gods... It will not rain in your land. And what I'm getting at is this, is that Jesus is, he's, he's actually, the 33 years that Jesus was on the planet, how many know that he was closing one epic season, or epoch season, and opening up another? Jesus lived, if you will, in the tension of two, of two, of two uh, transition, of two covenants. And so when Jesus said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. They would have known that Jesus is talking about the fact that they were supposed to hate those who hated God. In fact, David bragged, God, do I not hate those who hate you? And then Jesus said, but I say to you, love your neighbor. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And listen to this. You'll be like your Father in heaven who makes it rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. How many know in the old covenant, it didn't rain on the unrighteous? But in the new covenant... God's pouring his spirit out on all flesh. How many of you know God is making it rain on people who don't deserve it? That would be like most of the people in this room, including me. And so the point is, is that Jesus ushered in the greatest epic season in human history in which God applied his blood to the entire creation. And by the way, how many understand that Jesus didn't just die for humans? He died for all creation. Why did Jesus have a crown of thorns on his head? What was the curse over Adam? You remember the curse over the serpent was you're going to crawl on the ground and I'm going to put enmity or hostility between you and the woman? 
And the, and the curse over the woman was, I'm going to increase your pain in childbirth, and your husband will rule over you. And by the way, your husband will rule over you, not all men. Good point, Chris. Thank you for that. This might be one of those conferences where the first crowd is bigger, and then it gets smaller and smaller until it's like me and the pastor. But the curse over Adam was, you're going to till the ground, but it's going to yield thorns and thistles. The point is, you're going to do the right thing, but the wrong thing is going to happen. Why did Jesus wear a crown of thorns on his head? Because how many know when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just die for humans, he died for all creation. That's why Romans 8 says that creation is groaning, waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation is waiting for its born-again experience. How many know that we're going to get a new earth, a new heaven, and a new earth? For the old earth and the old heaven have what? passed away. How many know when you received Jesus, you became a new creation and old things have passed away? How many know you got your born again experience, but creation's waiting for its? When I look in the mirror, I still look like the same person I was, but God said I'm a new creation. And he said old things have passed away. It's just a thought I had. I thought I'd share that with you. My point is that when Jesus died on the cross, that he literally split history in half, and God actually, God actually interacts with the world differently than he did before the cross. Um, it's an interesting statement. You know, sometimes cheap people, um, they, they, they talk about grace in a way that seems cheap. But Jesus said, um, from the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom suffered violence, and the violent took, and violent men took the kingdom by force. And in another passage, he said that, um, well, well, we'll leave it there. My point would be this, that how many understand that when Jesus died on the cross, that through a violent act of grace, you got into the kingdom? See, the, Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you don't come into the kingdom and you resist anyone who tries to get in. And Jesus talked about the fact that, that the law and the prophets were till John. And from the days of John, everyone's forcing their way into the kingdom and violent men are taking the kingdom by force. How many know Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets? The law said, you didn't keep the rules, you can't come in here. The prophet said, of the Old Testament said, you didn't keep the rules, you deserve to be judged. But how many understand that through a violent act of grace, people who didn't deserve the kingdom got in? You know, what's funny to me is, we get in through his works, and then we want everyone else to get in through theirs. <laughs> There's another thought. And what I'm getting at is that Jesus, it's, um, you know, think about this, what happened at the cross. Put, let's pretend that Rachel is a judge, and, and Bethany killed my brother. And we come before the judge, and the judge says, oh, Bethany, your dad was my golfing friend. Go free. How many know that's mercy? But it's not justice. See, how many know that God sits on a mercy seat, but the foundation of his throne is righteousness and justice? <laughs> See, Jesus, God, has a challenge. He has to create justice so he can release mercy. And I'm like, wait a second. You can't let her, you can't let her go. She killed my brother. And, though, and then... Bethany's mother comes and says, I will die for Bethany. And the judge looks, Mrs. Roper, Mrs. Roper, I'm sorry, you can't die for Bethany because you actually are a fugitive yourself. You owe for your own sins. How I many know all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? And the soul, the soul that sins shall die. She can't die for her daughter because she has to die for her own sin. All of a sudden, the the judge's son steps up 
to the court and says, Your Honor, I will die for her. And the judge looks, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, wait a second. You don't owe for your sin, so you can die for hers. And I'm like, wait a second, he can't die for her sin? Like, he, she killed my brother. Yes, but your brother was also on death row. I will give my sinless son for your guilty brother. And so when Jesus died on the cross, how many understand? He fulfilled justice so he can release mercy. So what's the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant? Well, there's some, lots of differences, but how many understand that the greatest difference is that God, that justice was fulfilled so God could release mercy? So how many understand that it rains on the righteous and the unrighteous now, and God can make it rain on unrighteous people and not be unjust because Jesus already paid for it on the cross? So Jesus, so the greatest epic epoch season in the history of the world was the cross. But I want to talk to you about the second greatest season, epic, epoch season, sorry, in the history of the world. And that's the season that I believe that we're coming into right now. I believe we're in the second greatest epoch season in the history of the world. I want to just describe to you an, an, uh, an epic season. When the children of Israel, when they, were, when they went from the wilderness, they crossed the Jordan River, how many know it says the manna ceased, the cloud by day was gone, the fire by night was gone, and God said, walk them to the promised land. Now, how many understand that it's not too hard to lead on one side of the river, be a leader on one side of the river, it's not too hard to lead on the other side of the river, but it's very difficult to be the leader in one ep epoch season and lead well in the other. Moses couldn't do it. And God went from doing miracles to them to doing miracles through them. Think about this. If you're, if you're an Israelite and you're in the wilderness, you've seen God in the fire every day. Like God's presence is actually physically visible in the fire. God's presence is physically visible in the cloud. Are you with me? God's presence is physically visible in that you have angel food every day. All you do for three day, three, you know, for 40 years, three meals a day is eat manna. And then you cross the river, and the supernatural weather system's gone, and the supernatural food system's gone, and God goes, you're in the promised land. See, how many know the wilderness was welfare? Here we go. I'd like to propose that God wants to get his people off of welfare. That he wants to co-labor with his people. That God doesn't just want to do miracles to you, he wants to do miracles through you. And you can imagine when they crossed the Jordan River, the Bible says, in the day they crossed the Jordan River, the manna ceased. There is nowhere where God told them the manna would cease. It just said it ceased. I propose to you that if you were born in the wilderness, then how many understand that when they crossed the Jordan River, there was only two people that crossed that river that weren't born in, in the wilderness, and that was Joshua and Caleb. Everyone else had only known manna for 40 years. For 40 years, all they ate was manna. In fact, they ate quail, but the people who crossed the Jordan wouldn't have even known the quail. That was their parents. All they'd ever eaten for 40 years is manna. All they've ever done is gather manna for 40 years. How many know that if you're the gold medal Olympic manna gatherer in the wilderness, you don't want the manna to cease in the promised land? And they crossed the Jordan River and the manna ceases. And I'd propose to you that they probably thought they were on a seven-day fast. Because they had fasted in the wilderness. And about day eight, they're like, oh, we're on a 14-day fast. And day 15, we're like, oh, we're on a 40-day fast. And about day 42, I picture Mary. She turns to Joel and says, you need to get a job. <laughs> and he says, what's a job? That's why they put the book of job in the Bible. Because how many understand that they had never worked in their life? These people, all they did was gather manna. But Isaiah 42, 9 says, The former things have come to pass. Behold, I proclaim what? New things to you. I'd like to suggest that God's not doing the next thing. He's doing the new thing. See, if God was doing the next thing, the thing you, you did would have something to do with the thing you're about to do. But how many know God's not doing the next thing? God's doing the new thing. 
And it requires a new song. Sing to the Lord a new song. What does it mean, sing to the Lord a new song? It means God's doing a new thing and you need what? A new way of thinking. Jesus said about John the Baptist, he said, John sang the dirge, that's the funeral song, and you didn't mourn. I played the flute, it's the wedding song, and you didn't dance. What was he saying? He's saying, you weren't congruent with any season. Are you with me? I'm saying Jesus used mu music to depict epoch seasons. And I propose to you that we've just crossed the Jordan River. And God's not doing the next thing. God's doing the new thing and requires a new song. Eric Hoffer said, in times of change, learners inherit the earth while the learned find themselves beautifully prepared for a world that no longer exists. In times of change, learners inherit the earth, but the learned find themselves beautifully prepared for a world that doesn't exist. A friend of mine, in our very first year of school of ministry 20 years ago, his name was Eric, and Eric graduated from our school of ministry, and at graduation, during the graduation, which was very small, 37 students, he leaned over to me. He had a PhD in theology. By the way, I have no problem with people having higher education. But this is what Eric said. He had a PhD in theology. He wanted to go into the ministry, and the Lord told him that he needed to do a school of ministry. One year of school ministry. And he leaned over to me. He didn't want to go. He fought for the first three months. He was my worst student. He only went out of obedience. He didn't go out of passion. But by the end of the year, he turned to me, and on the stage, he said, you know what I learned? I said, what? He said, in seminary, I learned to answer questions no one was asking. I'd like to propose to you that we've just crossed the Jordan River. And that heaven, the way in which God deals with a certain people in a certain season, has changed. How many of you know... Do you get the metaphor? When they were in the wilderness, God dealt with them. I just told you, manna, fire by day, I'm sorry, fire by night, cloud by day. God dealt with this same people when they crossed the Jordan River. I'm saying, when they crossed the Jordan River, by the way, they really did cross the Jordan River. It's not a metaphor. But when they crossed the Jordan River in the first heaven, how many know they crossed into a new epic epoch season in the third heaven in which God dealt with the same people in a different way? The Bible says that the sons of Issachar understood the times. It's 1 Chronicles 12, 32. The sons of Issachar were famous for two things. They understood what time it was, and they understood what Israel should do in the times. I suggest that the greatest question that we should be asking right now is, what time is it? What epic time is it how is God dealing with us now and that the key word for this season is flexible because the God who dealt with you one way on the wilderness side of the river is dealing you dealing with you differently on the promised land side of the river. Remember, the land of Egypt was the land of not enough. They were slaves. The wilderness was the land of just enough. Remember, they could collect manna for only one day. There was no such thing as savings. But how many know the promised land was the land of what? More than enough. It was the land of milk and honey. It was the land flowing with milk and honey. It was the land of more than enough. In fact, it was so more than enough, they didn't conquer the entire land that God gave them for 400 years. God gave them so much land that it took them 400 years to actually receive the promise. How would you like to have God give you so much, exceedingly, abundantly, more than you ask or think? You're like, God, I want this, and God's like, I want to give you this. How would you like your inheritance to be so great your children's 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 children are still getting all the territory that God promised you in covenant? 
I believe that God's not doing the next thing, but he is doing the new thing. And I believe that most churches have crossed the Jordan River and they're still doing manna classes. And we're eating manna by faith and we're getting skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. And our favorite song is The Way We Were. And I don't know if you know this, but religion is dead. We may be the only ones who don't know it. Like people are exiting traditional churches in mass numbers that in, in Europe and in, and in America we've not known in 200 years. And it's not because people don't want God. It's because they don't want manna. And they might be the ones who are right. Uh oh. Thank you, Chris. Do you have another message? So I want to talk to you about the second greatest transition in human history. I want to talk about it for the, probably a couple of sessions. And I, then I want to talk to you about what you should do about it, what I should do about it. 19 years ago, this would be the 20th year actually, that Kathy and I came to Bethel. We left the business world and we. We moved, to, uh, we moved out of the mountains. We were living in a little um, town called Weaverville. How I many you know you can't even sound like you have an education when you're from Weaverville? Where are you from? I'm from Weaverville. <laughs> really? Did you graduate from sixth grade? Barely. <laughs> and we moved to, we had businesses and we got rid of our businesses and we moved to Redding, California to start the school ministry. And we were living in this little apartment. We had gone through a crisis in our finances. We lost our business. That's a whole other story. I'm, I'm glad to tell it, but it's not relevant to what we're doing tonight. And uh, I, we were living in this little apartment, a two-bedroom apartment, and, and I was going through, we were both going through a lot, and I would go into the, at middle of the night, you couldn't sleep a lot, and I would go into the other bedroom and lay on the floor and just pray and talk to God. And one morning, I was laying there, it was very early in the morning, and the Lord spoke to me, and he said, You're, we're moving he said, we're moving from denominationalism to apostleships. Ask me what that means. Now, I knew it was God because anything that has more than one syllable, I don't know that word. I don't use words like that. And so I said, what does that mean? And the Lord said, in denominationalism, and by the way, everybody say ism. So I'm not talking about denominations. I might even slip and say denominations, but I'm talking about the ism like communism. It's the spirit. Are you with me? Yeah. And by the way, just, just to preference this, I believe there's as much denominationalism in apostolic networks as there is in denominations. So it doesn't matter what it says over the door of your church. It matters what it says over the door of your heart. You're not going to solve denominationalism by leaving your denomination and saying, we're Joe's apostolic network. It, it's a heart thing. Are you with me? And the Lord said, in denominationalism, in denominationalism, people gather when they agree, and they divide when they disagree. Think about it. We are in the 500th year of the Reformation this year. And by the way, not by chance that, it, that England came out of the EU. I didn't make a political statement. You might have think I did, but I didn't. It's not by chance that the Lord decided to reform you in the 500th year of the Reformation. You remember when the Catholic, when, when Martin Luther, I almost said John Wesley, and John Wesley was with him in spirit, when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of the Catholic Church, Martin Luther left the Catholic Church, not over social issues, not over, you understand, like I'm not... A historian, so I'm just giving you a documentary. I have no idea if he should have left, he should have stayed. I, I don't have an opinion. I honestly don't have an opinion about that. I'm only telling you, I'm only sharing a documentary. When he left the Catholic Church, he left, if you will, over doctrinal disagreements. Are you with me? And the Lord said to me, I'm about to pour out revelation on this generation that's been held in the vaults of heaven for the eons of ages, even the angels long to look in the revelation I'm about to release on this generation. 
When Daniel said in the last days knowledge will increase, he wasn't talking about the internet. He was talking about the knowledge of the glory of the Lord that will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. It means it'll be wide and deep. And God said, I'm about to reveal things about my nature that have been hidden for the eons of ages. But if I release revelation on this generation, no, if I release if I le release revelation on this wineskin that people gather when they agree and they divide when they disagree, it's going to rip the wineskin. Think about it. If I'm a shepherd of a denominational ism church and I realize that people have come to this church like they chose this church because they agree with the doctrine. They gathered because they agreed. And by the way, let me ask you a question. How many times has the Catholic Church split in 2,000 years? Well, I'll tell you the, the answer. Twice. How many times has the Protestant Church split in 500 years? Let's make it easy. In the last 30 days. <laughs> you get my point. What do the Catholics call the leaders of their individual churches? Father. Are you with me? If I'm a leader, if I'm a shepherd of a denominationalism church, that's a little hard to say, and I realize that people gathered when they agree and they divide when they disagree, what do I have to make sure they don't do? Disagree. What does it take to have a disagreement? An opinion. What's it take to have an opinion? A thought. What do I have to make sure you don't do? I have to make sure you don't think. So I don't preach to inspire you. I preach to convince you. See, it's the opposite of a revelatory culture because when people start thinking, thinking is dangerous business. So I don't teach people how to think. I teach them what to think. And then I redefine what it means, what terms of the Bible mean to keep you from thinking. And I say things like, loyalty means you agree with me. Actually, loyalty is only tested when we don't agree. I say, I, 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 I say, unity is when, if we could just all agree, we could change the city. I'm sorry, Jesus had 12 disciples when he walked the earth, and he couldn't get 12 guys to get along when he walked the earth, and they changed the world. <laughs> okay, I'm kind of ruining it for some of you, like, oh, there goes your notes for Sunday. <laughs> Listen, I like people to get along, but it's called the unity of the spirit. Not the unity of doctrine. So in denominationalism, we gather when we agree and we divide when we disagree. But in apostleships, I don't choose the church because of what they believe. Now doctrine's important. We'll get to that in a minute. But I choose the church because that's my family. I go, there's my dad, there's my mom, my cousins, my brothers, and my crazy uncle. And by the way, everybody has a crazy uncle. You know the guy that when your friends come over, see, you don't choose your family, but you choose your friends, right? And they choose you. So you just pray that your crazy uncle stays in the cellar when your friends come over. <laughs> How many people have a crazy uncle or a crazy aunt? Of course, and some of you are lying. You're like, I don't have a crazy one. We all know you. No, you are the crazy uncle. <laughs> the person next to you raised their hand like, Have you ever asked yourself why the greatest inventions, innovations, creativity, art, the greatest intellectual property in the world isn't flowing from the church? I mean, think about this. Like, how many of you understand, before you knew Jesus, you didn't have the mind of Christ? How many of you know that? Just, okay, let me just try this. Everyone raise your hand. Okay, just making sure, okay, so, so you really didn't agree with me. Okay, so before you met Jesus, you didn't have the mind of Christ. After you met Jesus, you had the mind of Christ. That means what? You think God's thoughts. Like, you want to know what God's thinking? Yeah, what are you thinking? You have the mind of Christ. You think like God. Thank you, Chris, for that. Before you met Jesus, you didn't have the creator, the creator inside of you. 
after you met, you're like, I'm too hot, man. I ain't exercising, I'm telling you right now. And the people are sitting next to you like, please don't raise your arms. Before you met Jesus, you did not have the creator of all the universe living inside of you. Correct. After you met Jesus, the creator of the entire universe, the God who made everything, literally, literally lives inside of you. You are literally a mobile home for God. I can't do anything without God. That's true, but he's always there. I can't do anything without God. Without God, that's true, but he's always with you. So what's your excuse? How many know John the Baptist was the greatest prophet of the Old Testament? Jesus himself said that. But he said, but the least in the kingdom was greater than John. How many know that means that John was greater than Moses, David, Esther, Daniel. Just who's your favorite guy? Jesus said John was greater. Daniel was ten times wiser than all the wise men of Babylon. John was greater than Daniel. And guess what? The least in the kingdom is greater than John, who is greater than Daniel, who was ten times wiser than all the, all the wise men in Babylon. And you, how many of you understand? You are a new creation in the kingdom. And you, the least in here, you're like, oh, I'm stupid. Well, you're smarter than Daniel, who was 10 times wiser than all the wise men. How many know before you knew Jesus, you were not seated in heavenly places with Christ? But after you met Jesus, you were literally seated in heavenly places with Christ, far above all principalities and powers and every name that's ever been named. You weren't just seated in heavenly places, you were seated in heavenly places with Christ. And by the way, Jesus is sitting on the throne of David, not his own throne. And you're seated with him. How many of you know you live on earth and in heaven? You are currently here in Bath, and you are currently seated in heavenly places. When you, when you became a new creation, the word new there means, there's two words for the Greek word new. One means like you got a new car, and the other word means prototype, never before created. This is the word prototype. It means a creature that never graced the planet before. When you received Jesus Christ, you actually became a different species of creature. That's why it's put, Peter said that you are strangers and aliens. You're the first creature, at least that we know of, that lives on earth and in heaven. The question is, do you live from earth to heaven or from heaven to earth? See, if you live from earth to heaven, how many of you know your prayers are always reactionary? You're always praying about what already happened. But if you live from heaven to earth, do you remember when, the, when, John, when John the Apostle, when Jesus said to John the Apostle, come up here, it's Revelation 4, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things? You go, do you believe in the rapture? Well, I believe you were raptured once already because you already came up here. How many understand that your heavenly seat, come up here and I'll show you what must take place after these things. How many understand your heavenly seat gives you eternal perspectives? Now, you're praying not from earth to heaven, but from heaven to earth, and your prayers become prophecies and your words become worlds. Now, you're not reacting to what happened, but you are actually dictating you are actually co-creating with God. Winston Churchill said, history will be kind to me, for I intend to write it. How many understand that you are actually making history his story? Before you knew Jesus, you weren't seated in heavenly places. But now that you've met Jesus, you're seated in heavenly places with Christ, and your heavenly seat gives you eternal perspectives so that you can see things long before they take place. How many of you know before you met Jesus, you did not have the 1 Corinthians chapter 12 gift of wisdom, spiritual gift of wisdom? But after you met Jesus, you have the spiritual gift of wisdom. Before you met Jesus, you did not have the manifold wisdom of God, Ephesians chapter 3, that's been given to the church to teach principalities and powers the mysteries of God. 
But after you met Jesus, you received the manifold. It's the word multidimensional or multicolored. You receive the manifold wisdom of God in which you will teach principalities and powers about the kingdom. Now, I can give you, I think there's 42 of those. 42 advantages you have over the person who does not yet know God. Now tell me, where should the inventions, innovation, creation, cures for diseases, where should the next great car come from, automobile, jet, plane, and things that we haven't even thought of yet? You remember when a hard drive was a rough road? We don't even have language for the things that are coming. My point is this. Who should be on the edge of all innovation, invention? Who should be? It should be the church. I'm saying, are these realities or are they just philosophies and theologies that we believe that never really happen? How many of you know, if we were on the cutting edge of all thinking in the world, if you went to church as an unbeliever, received Jesus Christ, got baptized, and came out of the tank thinking, the world would be rushing the aisles. <laughs> They'd be like, I know John, he's an idiot. Well, he was. <laughs> now he's building a rocket in his backyard. I'm simply saying, are these promises, are they philosophies, theologies, or are they realities? And I'm asking you the question, why are the most brilliant, the creator on board people not a millennium ahead of everybody else would it not be jealousy evangelism remember that's what God used in the Old Testament he said I'm gonna so bless a certain see God wanted everybody but they didn't want God so he goes all right I'm gonna sing lots of people and I'm gonna so bless this one people that everyone's gonna want me Jealousy, evangelism. God says, you, you know, I love this story. Remember when the Ark of the Covenant, David was trying to get it into the city of Zion, and it, he, some things happened, and a guy died on the way, and David gets scared, and he takes it to Obed-Edom's house. <laughs> and it says that it was there for three months. And it says that everything in Obed-Edom's house, at Obed-Edom's house, was blessed. Everything. And it says, the word came back to the king that everything in Obed-Edom's house is blessed because the ark's there. And David said, okay, we're getting the ark, come on. <laughs> My point is, the ark is at Obed-Edom's house. It's in your garage. Everything in your garage, everything in your house, all your children, all your grandchildren, your finances, it is supposed to be blessing you. You're supposed to be the wisest, the smartest, the most blessed people on the planet. It is jealousy evangelism. But why is it not happening? And I'd propose to you, because in denominationalism, we have been taught to not think. It's like having a Ferrari with 1,200 horsepower and 257 mile an hour top speed, and you listen to the radio. And someone's like, don't start that. You could get hurt. That's called religion. And when people come to church and we reduce them. Don't come here with a new idea. We've been doing this for 40 years and we like the circle we're making. See, I... Somebody, we met with some folks and they said that there's so much uncertainty since you left the EU. I'm like, no, it's not uncertain. It's just unknown. <laughs> See, I don't have to feel uncertainty when I don't know what's ahead because I know who is with me. <laughs> you know, a pessimist says the glass is half empty. The optimist says the glass is half full. But the believer... 
The believer doesn't care how much is in the glass. The believer wants to know who's the source. There can be no oil in the jar. Come on, help me. There doesn't have to be any oil in the jar. If I'm an optimist, I go, oh, there'll be oil at some point. But if I'm a believer, I go, get more jars. I'm not called to be an optimist. I'm called to be a believer. I'm not believing that the elements will be right. I'm believing in the God who made the elements, who said, I'm about to bless you. I'd like to propose that God's about to bless your country in a way that you haven't seen in 1,500 years. The future is not uncertain. It's just unknown. How many of you like surprises? I'm saying, if your husband comes to you and he's a good guy and he goes, I have a surprise for you. I'm giving it to you Friday. Are you anxious or are you excited? Well, that depends on his character. Right? I'm saying, if he's a good man and you've lived with him your life and you trust him and he says, I have a surprise for you and it's Monday and he said, it's coming Friday. How many know you're not scared, you're excited? The future is not uncertain. It's just unknown. And if you know who promised it, you're excited, not afraid. People are like, but all these terrible things are happening. Ah, whenever God moves, the enemy comes in. Remember, God's sending a deliverer, Moses, and what does the enemy do? He's killing off all the firstborn. Are you telling the, the times by who's dying or who's in the palace? Are you saying, these are the worst times in history? Maybe because you don't know about the X factor. You haven't factored in that God has a Moses. You don't know why the enemy has come in. He's only come in because God said, I'm about to move. Try and stop me. How many know when Jesus is sent to save the world, what does the enemy do? He's trying to kill all the firstborn sons. Why? Is it a good season or a bad season? I propose to you that it's about to be the best season in the history of the world. But there's bad things happening. That's because good things happen. Are about to happen. So you gotta put on new eyes. I pray that you would see. I pray that you, that the spirit of the sons of Issachar would be on you. Nebuchadnezzar comes into Babylon. Uh, Becomes king of Babylon. What's the, one of the first things he does? Makes war against Israel. You know the story. Destroys Israel. Destroys the first temple. Captures all the people. Is it a good time or a bad time? Well, oh, you'd agree it's a bad time. But Neb made one mistake. He put, kept four boys and put them in his service. One strategic mistake. See, if you're looking at Israel, you will miss God's X factor. Named Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Nebuchadnezzar goes, I beat those people. And God says, I haven't spoke yet. And you know the story. He serves Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar has an encounter with God, becomes a believer. <laughs> Decrees that everyone has to serve the God of Daniel, who he doesn't even know. He says, God of Daniel, don't know his name, but whoever it is, serve him. <laughs> and then you'll remember that he serves the king's son, Belshazzar. And then he serves Darius, who put him in the lion's den. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but Daniel was thrown in the lion's den at 92. Maybe why the lions didn't eat him. <laughs> nah. And
And then he served Cyrus. Now, a lot of people don't know the story. The prophet Jeremiah prophesied before Cyrus was born that there will be a king. His name will be Cyrus. And in the 70th year, he will let my people go back and rebuild the temple. That's a great prophecy, right? And what does Daniel do for 70 years in Babylon? Daniel's in Babylon from the first year of Jeremiah's prophecy to the last. And every day, three times a day, what does he do? He throws the windows open and he prays towards Jerusalem. He just happens to be there in the 70th year. In the 70th year, he goes to Cyrus and he said, hey, there's a prophet in Israel who talked about you before you were born. Your name's Cyrus, you're in the book. You're supposed to let the people of God go. Now, what isn't in the book is that when Cyrus let the people go, which he, because of his relationship with Daniel, he lets the people of God go back and rebuild the temple. What Jeremiah didn't realize is that not only was Cyrus going to let the people go, but he was going to fund the most expensive building project in the history of the world from the treasury of Babylon. No, Persia. The most expensive building project in the world was funded through Cyrus, who wasn't a believer. But here's the most important part. Do you know who wrote the Bill of Rights that's in the United Nations? It was Cyrus. You know who taught him about the Bill of Rights? It was Daniel. Do you know that when Daniel, when Daniel mentored three kings, he served four? That literally, that Daniel is still speaking through the United Nations who uses the Bill of Rights that Cyrus wrote that Daniel taught him. See, you just don't really know what's happening. Because you're listening to the news. Good point, Chris. <laughs> I'm helping you. I believe that we're moving from denominationalism to apostleships and that we're in the greatest transition in the history of the world. When I was laying on the floor that day, that morning, the Lord said to me, we're in the new apostolic age. And I believe that the world will benefit from what God is doing. <clears throat> you know, Jesus said, I'll build the church. You extend the kingdom. <laughs> so funny, we spend all of our time building the church and wonder who in the heck's extending the kingdom. <laughs> See, part of the challenge is we think the church is the kingdom. I'd like to propose to you that all the church is in the kingdom, but not all the kingdoms in the church. I'd like to propose to you that God's bigger than his book. Uh oh Wait, don't leave yet. Let me finish. Didn't John, the apostle John said, if all the miracles that Jesus did were written down, that they couldn't, that the books, the earth itself could not contain the books? Listen, I'm not talking about extra books. I'm saying God is bigger than the Bible. Some people say all the answers for life are in the Bible. No, they're not. All the answers for life are in the author. Some of the answers for life are in the Bible. Now, I believe there are things that are biblical, extra biblical, and anti biblical. I'm not talking about anti biblical. You're like, I believe every word in the Bible, and that's the only thing I do. No, you don't. You ever seen someone receive Jesus in church? And the pastor says, if you want to receive Jesus, raise your hand. Anyone ever seen that? Not in the Bible. Ever ask anyone to pray a prayer to receive Jesus? Not in the Bible. See, there's a big difference between Christianity and following Jesus. <laughs> I can pray a prayer and receive Jesus, but I can't be a follower of Jesus just by praying a prayer. 
Anyway, okay. <laughs> I'm simply saying that when we receive Jesus by raising our hand or repeating a prayer, which is the way I receive Jesus, but we're not taught that being born again means I follow Jesus. How many know I can, I can, <laughs> I'll be careful. I can be a Christian and live with my girlfriend, but I can't be a follower of Jesus and live with my girlfriend because he ain't going that way. See, when, when I pray a prayer to receive Jesus, then questions like, once I'm saved, am I always saved? See, that's not a question if I'm following Jesus. It's only a question if I pray to prayer. I'm saying, we have moved from the gospel of salvation to the gospel of the kingdom, but lots of people are still in the gospel of salvation. And Jesus didn't teach us to preach the gospel of salvation. He taught us to preach the gospel of the kingdom. I'm in a new kingdom with new ways. I can't live immorally and follow Jesus, but I can live immorally and be a Christian because now being a Christian means I agree with some philosophies and theologies. I embrace the things I don't practice. And by the way, if I feel it, I am it. Because feelings trump the truth. Good point, Chris. Thank you for all of that. So we're moving. What time is it? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we preach the eternal gospel. The only reason we wear a watch is to see if the date changed. Okay. Um, let me just uh, finish with this, and then, we'll, and then tomorrow we'll pick up the subject. We're in the new abstock season. What does it mean to be an apostle? Very simple. What's it mean to be apostle? I'll explain this to you. T Ten minutes is good? Okay. You can endure till the end, and you'll be saved. That's in the Bible. <laughs> yeah. What's it mean to be an apostle? Okay. So the word apostle means sent one. The word was invented by the Greeks about 400 years before the Romans were ruling Jerusalem. And so the Greeks actually came up with the idea. It doesn't just mean to be sent, though. It means to be sent from a place to another place, to reproduce in the place you're sent to what you, what you were sent from until the place you're sent to looks like the place you're sent from. Simply put, it means cultural transformation. <laughs> So the word doesn't just mean be sent, it means to be sent with a mission to reproduce in another place what you were sent from till the place you're sent to looks like the place you're sent from. Are you with me? Okay, so the Romans were obviously, uh, obviously leading, ruling the, Jewish, ru ruling the Jews at the time of Christ. So sometimes people say, why were there no apostles in the Old Testament? Well, first of all, the word wasn't invented. So the Romans were like Hitler, right? They were conquering the world. They were conquerors. They wanted to conquer the known world. Did a pretty good job of it, actually. And when you're in Rome, you do as the Romans do. So the Romans were conquering cities. And let's say they conquer one city, city two, city three. And they come back to the first city that they conquered. And the people were back to their old ways. And the Romans said, why are we conquering cities, but we're not culturizing them? So the, so the Romans are the ones who made the word apostle famous. They took the Greek idea, concept of apostle, and they... They, they took some of their generals and they named some of their generals apostles. And then with the generals, who are now called apostles, they would send them out to war, but with the military also went philosophers and teachers and politicians and musicians and artists. So they would conquer and culturize. Conquer and culturize. Are you with me? So when Jesus promotes his learners, disciple means learner, to leader. It's interesting what he called them because he could have called them priests. There was the whole Levitical priestly order, right? He could have called them prophets, so there was sons of the prophets. He, he, he could have called them patriarchs. There was 12 patriarchs, there was 12 disciples. But instead, he takes a word that would be as secular as the word CEO, a very popular common word, and he says, you are my apostles. And then he gives them an apostolic prayer. What's the prayer? Our Father who's in heaven, help me. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Where are you seated? 
in heavenly places. What's your job? Make earth like heaven. How many understand we're trying to get people to heaven, but Jesus didn't emphasize going to heaven. He emphasized heaven coming to earth. How many know if you get heaven and people, then you'll have heaven, you'll have people in heaven. <laughs> Are you with me? So I'm saying Jesus talks very little about going to heaven. He talks a lot about the kingdom coming. And so the goal is to get the people in the kingdom. Because if you get people in the kingdom, then they're going to be in heaven. And by the way, God's not in heaven. Heaven's in God. Do you remember? Well, think about this. If God is eternal and the heavens and earth will pass away, that means the heavens and earth aren't eternal. So where did God live before there was heavens? <laughs> I'm seeing, David said it this way, the heavens, the highest heavens, could not contain him. The only reason God's in heaven is because heaven is inside of God. God is bigger than heaven. <laughs> so what's your mission? Get people to heaven? Of course, evangelism's important. But what's your ultimate mission? That it be on earth as it is in heaven. How many know that's an apostolic prayer? What's the, what does it mean? What does apostle, the word apostle mean? It means sent one. What does it mean? It means to be sent from a place to another place to reproduce in the place you're sent to what you were, what you were sent from until the place you're sent to looks like the place you're sent from. And guess what? That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's why you are an apostolic people. See, the goal isn't to get butts in a seat. Two hours on a Sunday morning. The goal is to extend the kingdom to the world. How many know Jesus is the light of the world? Have you ever heard someone preach, in the last days, the church will get brighter while the world gets darker? How many of you have heard a message like that? I've heard many of them. I preached them. Where is the light? It's in the... Oh, you don't even know. You're like... I don't know. I have no idea. I ain't raising my hand for anything. <laughs> See, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Then he said, you're the light of the world. A city on a hill that cannot be hidden. And see, think about this. If we're the light of the world, how can we get brighter and the world get darker if the light is stationed in the world? <laughs> Uh-oh. I'm saying, Jesus, listen, if I turn the lights up in here, if I get a light and I turn it up, is there any way that it can get brighter in here and darker at the same time? Yes, there is. How can you do that, Chris? You could put a basket over the light. Then you could turn the light up, and it could get brighter under the basket and darker in the room. But Jesus thought through that, and he said, no one takes a lamp and puts it under a basket but instead they set it on a yeah they set it up in a high place right so think about this before electricity you lit a lamp and you put it as high as you could in the room right so the light would go as far as it could this is the metaphor are you with me and then so jesus then said okay you're the light okay good where are you stationed in the world okay and how how are we going to make sure everyone sees you because we're going to put you on a top of a hill <laughs> Oh, here we go. I wrote a book called Heavy Rain. You should read it. It's my favorite book that I wrote. My favorite book, actually. But anyway, in that book, I'm almost done. In that book, my PA and I did a statistical study on American churches. And here's what we learned. The cities that had the greatest Christian church-going population had the worst social statistics in our nation. Okay, let me just make sure you hear what I just said. The more people that went to a Christian church in a city, the worse off the city was. The crime rose, divorce rose, poverty rose, sickness rose. Are you with me? In other words, I call it the huddle factor. I'm not saying that the people who went to church weren't better off. I'm saying the city went to hell as people went to heaven. What's the point? Gathering Christians don't transform cities. 
See, I'd propose that we put people in church so often they don't have time to be a light anywhere else and the church becomes a basket. And then the statistics get worse so we create an eschatology to feel okay about it. Well, brother, it's the last days. Jesus said in the last days. The light's going to get brighter and the darkness is going to get darker. I'd like you to show me where Jesus said that. Well, it says nation will rise against nation. Check, that's happened. There'll be earthquakes in diverse places. Check, that's happened. And you check the 13 things that Jesus said would happen. And guess what? They're all checked in Matthew 24. But the ones that aren't checked are, and you will make disciples of all nations. And I will pour my spirit out on all flesh. How many of you know the bad things have happened, but the promises to Abraham have not? <laughs> what was the promise to Abraham? And hope against hope, he believed, and so he shall become. So he became the father of what? Israel? No, many nations. And listen to this. Here's the rest of it. And so shall your descendants be. When Jesus said, make disciples of all nations, it wasn't a new idea. It was the promise to Abraham. Isaiah 2, I'm going to finish with this verse. Isaiah 2, you can turn there if you like. You won't even believe it's in there. Nobody's read this verse to you, I guarantee it. Maybe they have. Oh, I was wondering what was wrong. I was in Ezekiel. I'm like, wow, that was a... Isaiah 2, the word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now, it will come about in the last days. Okay, when is this supposed to happen? In the last days. Does it say it will come about in the millennium? No, okay, just making sure. That the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. And, the, and will raise the rub the hill and a couple nations will stream to it. Oh, oh, it says all the nations. And many people will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He'll teach us concerning his ways. We'll walk in his paths, for the law or the instruction will go forth from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between nations and render decisions between many people. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. When is that? It says... In the last days. You know why you haven't heard that verse? Because all the prophecies teachers put all the, push all the good stuff into the millennium. What if that's for today? Well, what if it isn't? I'll be the happiest guy the beast ever ate. When Jesus died on the cross, he defeated the devil. I don't know how he got his power back, but he didn't in my world. He told me that he put everything under my feet. I believe that. When David built the tabernacle of David and put the Ark of the Covenant in the midst of it and sent all the priests in, all the priests in, to minister 24 hours a day, do you know that the Bible of his day told him he can't do that? Do you know that the tabernacle of Moses that God instructed Moses to build was down the street in another? I'm leaving. <laughs> do you know that the tabernacle of Moses was down the street, but the Ark of the Covenant was in the middle of a tent. The Ark of the Covenant being in the tent was David's idea. David put priests in there 24 hours a day. The rules that God gave Moses was let one priest come in one time a year with blood and if he sweats, I'll kill him. They tied a rope around the priests so they could drag his butt out of there if he died. My point is this, is that David wasn't doing what the Bible said he could do. 
But the Bible says that David looked ahead and saw a day of grace. And he took what was for another day and he pulled it into his day. And he lived in grace in a season of law because he was a man who sat in heavenly places and said, I'll take that. I'll take it now.